Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. And we got a great one for you tonight, all about blue light and the effects on the retina. Uh, but before we begin, let me just give you a sense of the ground rules tonight. Uh, so as usual, uh, if you have questions uh, as we go, you'll see on the right-hand side of the screen a big Q&A box. Type your question in there, it'll come to us, and then I'll hold your question aside, and at the end of the show, um, we'll uh, do a little verbal Q&A. And I know the other big thing that people always want to know is our little door prize raffle. So um, that we'll do at the end of the show if we have time. And if not, uh, we'll do the drawing later tonight, and then we'll contact you by email if you won. Uh, so with that said, why don't we get moving here? Um, so tonight, we're, we're very happy to have Dr. Kirk Smith back again um, to give this talk all about uh, blue light and the retina. Uh, Dr. Smick, as you know, is the Chief of Optometric Services at Clayton Eye Center in uh, Morrow, Georgia. And I'm sure you've heard him talk before. Um, he's a, a prolific presenter. Um, he's also been awarded the Optometrist of the Year uh, in the state of Georgia um, and has been the president of the Georgia Optometric Association um, and serves as a technical advisor to many of the, the companies uh, who make the products that we all use every day. Um, so with that said, why don't I turn it on over to Dr. Smick? Well, thanks, Adam, and uh, I'm really excited about being here tonight. This is actually coming live from the Vision Council Annual Executive Summit meeting down here in Fort Lauderdale. And for those of you on the East Coast that got snowed in, I can tell you that our dinner meeting tonight was outdoors, but it was plenty cold, so this isn't typical Florida weather. I see several of my friends uh, are logged in, including uh, Cheryl Murphy and Anne-Marie Lahr, who uh, I had lunch with her boss, Barney, today, and her name came up, so it's good to be there. Uh, one of the reasons I'm excited about the uh, presentation tonight is because all of the science, which is pretty new to optometrists and opticians, about the product that we're going to be talking about. We're going to talk about ultraviolet light and high energy uh, visible blue light. And I think it'd be good to take a look at the spectrum and all of us refresh our memories uh, about um, where different light rays come from, and that'll help us understand it. So if you look at the slide that's up there now, you'll see that UV light, and as optometrists and opticians, and I know there's a few ophthalmologists online also, um, we know, we, we've been really aware of the harmful role of UV light as far as the eye is concerned for some time. And UV light, uh, just to refresh our memory, is non-visible. We really don't see UV light. So it was a little cool in Florida today. It was in the 60s, but several people were still out by the pool. And at dinner tonight, I noticed a lot of people had some pretty red faces. And that's because UV light comes through the clouds, uh, even if it's overcast, and, and causes the damage that it does. As far as the eye is concerned, uh, we've always known that UV light was implicated in cataracts and in pterygium formation. And that's something that uh, we protected our patients from with UV coatings for some time to come. The blue light, the high energy visible light, see we're moving in the spectrum from non-visible to now visible light, is something that's kind of new to us. Um, IOL manufacturers, interocular lens manufacturers in the United States, have always used um, UV filters in their implants, but not so much in terms of blue light. And that's because this information is fairly new. We know that extended periods of time of blue light introduction to the retina at particular wavelengths can cause damage and is implicated in macular degeneration. Macular degeneration, like diabetes, is really on the rise. And it's something that we in our clinics that, that see uh, primary care optometry patients are dealing with all the time. And the numbers are freely growing. And it's, uh, it's really a frightful disease because it causes blindness. And what's important is that our patients are learning more and more about it, and they're really concerned about it. And that, that really does provide us with an opportunity. Now, 
one of the things that I, I always like to remind my colleagues about is that obviously we need light. I mean, light plays a very valuable role, never mind the fact that the UV and the blue light uh, causes damage, but for visual acuity, color perception, and contrast sensitivity, we have to have light. The higher wavelengths of light are um, uh, over to the right there in the visible light, which are really, the, in terms of numbers, the lower wavelengths are the ones that are responsible for our visual functions. And we should also be reminded then that that light from those particular wavelengths are responsible for our sleep-wake cycle, our memory and mood, and our hormonal balance. And uh, I'm often reminded of this. I live in Atlanta, Georgia. That's where my optometric practice is. And about 12 miles south of me is a little sleepy town called Sonoya. And that's where all the new zombie, walking dead uh, people, the TV show that many of you watch is coming from. And if we didn't have access to this uh, low energy light that's visible to us, um, we would all be walking around like a bunch of zombies. So light is interesting in that it's both beneficial and harmful to vision and our general health. And that's something that is important to keep in mind. When we talk about, quickly here, UV light, um, we know and we remember from school that UVA, UVB, and UVC are three different types of ultraviolet light. And uh, it damages our skin. It's what causes sunburns. And then it's also implicated in cataract surgery. And I know in my practice, we have our own surgery center. And we do a couple thousand cataracts a year. And uh, certainly, UV light helps promote the development of cataracts. And uh, so that's something that we warn our elderly patients who have begun the development of cataracts about. As we move to the right on the spectrum, then after UV, we come into the blue light, or high energy visible light, we call that. Those are wavelengths that are short and have a lot of energy to them. And those are the ones that can accelerate retinal cell damage and actually apoptosis, which is retinal cell death. And the reason that I like the information that we're giving here so much is because there is so much research that's coming out of the Paris Vision Institute. Uh, and, and they've been doing this research for four to six years now. And we as a profession of eye care providers in America are only just now becoming actually um, uh, aware of this information and aware of the fact that uh, we have a responsibility really in our clinical practices to make sure patients are aware of this too. So uh, macular degeneration is really becoming uh, a big deal, and you'll see some numbers in a few minutes that can demonstrate the fact that uh, it's really growing. So here's a little um, kind of a reminder that UV light really affects the anterior segment of the eye. You can see the crystalline lens there where the cataract is formed. And then the high energy visible light, the blue light we call that, uh, has more activity in the posterior segment of the eye, or the retina. And that's why uh, the implication then of macular degeneration is so important. So uh, it's getting to the point, as we get more and more information, I kind of liken this to um, the whole nutraceutical and the AREDS2 information that's coming out as optometrists, as opticians, we really do have this concept of duty to warn. And I met with a group of retina specialist optometrists a couple months ago in November. And because of the AREDS2 information that's come out, uh, we really think that the standard of care now has finally become that we have a responsibility to talk to our early macular degeneration patients who are just starting to show the earliest clinical signs or first generation of macular degeneration because we know that those people are four times more likely to get macular degeneration 
if your mother or father have it. Um, we have a duty to warn them about the importance of nutraceuticals uh, be because of all the information <laughs> that's finally available from the AREG2 study. And I think that uh, the standard of care is going to be that if we don't document that we've recommended this to patients, then uh, it could come back to haunt us one day. I think blue light is going to enter that same arena. I don't think we're there yet, but uh, but we're we're getting there. And I think one day uh, we'll have a situation where we really do have a responsibility to let patients know that have the earliest signs of macular degeneration that they need to protect themselves from these particular wavelengths of light. So, excuse me, here you see that the cataract and macular degeneration population in just the United States, the growth of it. So the colleagues of mine who are out there listening tonight that, uh, that are going to be practicing 10, 15, and 20 years from now, uh, this is going to be a big deal. And I really predict that macular degeneration and optometry are going to be very closely linked in the next 20 years because the numbers are, are just staggering. And you can see that by 2050, there's going to be 5 million people just in the US and 50 million with cataracts. So that really brings the whole concept of health care and eye care and the optical dispensary back into the examination room. And I think that uh, as optometrists and as our opticians that we work so closely with, uh, we're really going to be communicating more and more to our patients about these conditions. And we're going to be prescribing more and more lenses that help protect our patients from different disease and uh, condition uh, things. So let's talk about the sources of ultraviolet and high energy visible blue light. Um, because lighting is changing in the world. Uh, the, the old way of lighting our rooms is changing. By 2015, in Western Europe, uh, they're, they're, they actually have a mandate then to change their kind of lighting because of, of uh, efficiency. And in the US, we're starting to see new light bulbs that uh, are more efficient. Uh, many of you have started changing them in your house already. We look at sunlight as the first example of light, and we, we know by experience that sunlight uh, exposure is widely modifi modified by the atmosphere. So depending on what season it is, the time of day, where you live, and which direction you're looking can make a big difference on what our exposure to blue light and UV light is. Uh, in the winter, where we have right now down here in South Florida, the sunlight was just blinding. And if you didn't have sunglasses, we were all eating outside today uh, at lunch. Um, you would get a headache really fast if you didn't have sunglasses on because of the angle of the light. And we know that blue light, uh, this is a fact now, uh, the proportion of during daylight can be between 25 and 30 uh, percent. So that's a lot of explosion exposure to these particular wavelengths. And we're going to talk about those wavelengths in a few minutes. And on a cloudy day, every mother in the world knows from experience of taking their kids to the beach on a cloudy day that even though it's cloudy out, kids get sunburned, and, and we do too, because 80% of the UV rays pass through the clouds. And you, you don't get the sensation that you're being exposed until uh, later that night or the next morning when you're red and, and hurt. So compact fluorescent lamps contain 25% harmful blue light. And when I say harmful, I, I'm really going to focus in on that in just a few minutes because the science is so compelling. And LEDs contain 35% of harmful blue light. And the cooler the white LED light, the higher uh, portion of blue amount. So on Christmas Day, I went to my daughter's house uh, to spend the day with her three children and husband. Then her three children are 10, 8, and 5. 
I walk into the house about 10 in the morning, and they're all three sitting on the same couch. They're all three, their eyes are about six to eight inches away from whatever those little game things are that electronically that they're playing now that are emitting harmful blue light. And they didn't even look up at me and say, hi, Grandpa, how you doing? They just kind of waved or nodded or whatever. And they're so focused on those games. And all you parents out there know exactly what I'm talking about. By 2020, 90% of all the light sources in North America are going to be LED. So that's a huge change. And that's an introduction of this particular light rays that we now know can be harmful to the eye and the retina, uh, and we're going to be exposed to them. Uh, this, is, this is a real change in our environment, and it's something that we're going to have to come to, this, to uh, concerns with. So discovery of blue violet light. And this is where we talk about some of the research. The I was fortunate enough to get to go to Paris this summer and spend three days at the Paris Vision Institute. And they do so much research there, it's overwhelming. And as optometrists and ophthalmologists and opticians, we all crave scientific background. Don't just come in and tell me about a product. Give me the science behind it. Let me know that it's, it really works. And that's, that's really important to us as, uh, as doctors, for sure. So in 2008, Essilor partnered with this independent company called the Paris Vision Institute. And they have been doing research on blue light for more than four years now. And what they've done, and I got to see all the testing, and it really, really drove the message home to me, they take a live retinal cells, they happen to be from pigs, and before anyone wonders what the relationship between the porcine retina cell and the uh, human retinal cell is, I can tell you that it, they're about as close as you can be, uh, and there's no other animal model that we can study that's any closer. So it, it really is relevant research. And, and I always get a question about that. Well, so, so what if this particular wavelength of blue light really does harm pig cells? What does that mean to me as a human? Well, it means a lot because they're very similar in their morphology. And, and I've actually looked into that to make sure that that was the case. So what they've done, and, and this is kind of the crux of my message tonight, is being able to tell you um, firsthand about the research. So what they do is they expose retinal cells to visible light overnight in 10 nanometer bands. And they find out the next day what the apoptosis rate or cellular death rate is. And they can measure that very accurately. And so they can find out what exact wavelengths are responsible for the most cellular death. And it, it's it's really simple if you think through the concept of this research, um, but it took, it took a bunch of scientists. And these people are PhDs in math and physics. They're not even I people, but that they brought in. And to listen to them speak uh, is, is just incredible. So what we found out, or what they found out, was that there was a particular selective band of the spectrum, the high energy visible light spectrum, known as blue violet light, that's most harmful. And it's that band between 415 and 455 nanometers. And this is, this is so wonderful to have exact science that's been able to do this. And remember, I already said, this is something that's been going on for more than four years. I mean, they have so much data. It's not just a notion. It's really scientific evidence. So the harmful, high energy, visible light is that blue-violet range between 415 and 455. And so that's what we hope to be able to prevent um, from entering the eye, protect the eye from that, particularly in, in 
a specific groups of patients that I'll talk about in a few minutes. So it's not unusual. We're, we're all familiar then with uh, the whole concept of uh, blue light blocking lenses. Um, 20 years ago, we had some lenses that did this, but they, they didn't selectively block this particular wavelength range. They did the whole blue-violet spectrum in, and the lenses were, if you remember, those of you that have been practicing for 10 or 15 years, uh, very yellow, very unattractive, and it was difficult to get our patients into a lens like that. Plus, now we know that we need all this good benefits of some light, and so we don't want to block the whole spectrum out. We have to be very careful only to block the harmful HEV light. Um, and so that's something that uh, Essilor has been working on. Other companies are working on this, and I, I'm sure we're going to get more and more out of it because it's so scientific now that I imagine every company one day will come out with this, and, and that's to all of our advantage, of course. So blue-violet light emission from LED and other sources is a real phenomenon that with this change in lighting and with all these new computers, tablets, cell phones, smartphones, uh, it's just going to be um, a situation where our next generation of kids are going to be so exposed to this that um, while we don't have any long-term data yet, it seems as if it could be really damaging and we need to, based on what we know today, uh, protect people from these particular light waves. So here you can see that we, as we move from the blue-violet over a little bit to the shift to the right in the spectrum, we get the blue-turquoise light. And that's what's responsible then for our pupillary constriction and our human biological clock, which is our sleep-wake patterns and visual acuity and color perception. We want that light. That's good light. So again, we're looking for some methodology whereby we can block particular wavelengths of light that are harmful, but yet still allow clarity and passage of the good light. Uh, and that's the trick, and that's what all of, uh, of our lens engineers are working on now. This is just uh, a quick peek at our time clock. Uh, based on light, based on our different bodily functions, everything from lower body temperature of 430, go across over on the other side at 9 o'clock, high blood pressure, and all of us that work with glaucoma know that there's a cyclical change in terms of when pressure is higher and lower. So uh, there's a lot of synchronization that goes on here that's just part of our bodily clock. So now I want to introduce you to a new concept, a new technology called light scan. And, and this is, as a, as a doctor, as someone who is taking care of patients, and my opticians who I rely on, rely on so much, um, I want to talk about this concept of light scan and selective photofiltration. I've kind of been dancing around this a little bit earlier, but the whole point is now that we've identified, and there's no argument about this. I mean, the science is there. Uh, now that we've identified this toxic range of 415 to 455 nanometers, but yet we've also identified the essential good light range, we need to be able to block one of those and allow the rest to come through. And that's the trick, and that's the lens solution that we're looking for for some particular categories of patients of mine, and, uh, and I'll go into that in just a minute. So light scan then is this patented, selective, no glare technology. It's selectively, there's three features here that, that if I do nothing else, I want to get through tonight. So it selectively filters out the harmful blue, violet, and UV light, and we've identified uh, what those light rays can cause. But we also have identified that there's very beneficial visible light that we need to allow to pass through. 
And at the same time, we want the lens, the spectacle lens that the patient is wearing, to maintain excellent transparency for clarity of vision. So there's a lot of things we need to do here and put together to come out with a formula of the best lens possible. So welcome Prezol Preventia, a new no-glare lens that actually protects patients against those particular 415 to 455 nanometer of blue, violet, and UV light. Uh, and, and that's the new product. It's just now coming out. Uh, we all know about front side and back side protection. That's something that uh, uh, came uh, known. To, it, it's interesting to me that only in the last five years uh, a doctor from Pacific University in Forest Grove, Oregon, an optometrist by the name of Carl Sytek, who was doing some studies, uh, found out that, yeah, we're protecting uh, UV light from our patients by UV filters, but what we didn't realize was at least 20% of the UV light enters the eye from reflection off the back surface, and we weren't doing anything about that. We were blocking the UV light coming directly through the lens, but not the backside protection. Well, once we discovered that, again, quite by accident, um, now we're able to do coatings on both the front and the back side of the lens, and really we're able to protect our patients from the harmful UV light. And that, that's a, a significant step forward. Now, front side blue-violet light deflection that's what the Crizol Preventia lens or coating does. And 20% uh, of the blue-violet light is deflected by this new coating. Uh, I have a pair of these lenses. I can tell you that they're not yellow. They don't look yellow like so many of the original blue light blocking models. But if you get a reflection of a light just right off it, you will get kind of a blue-violet reflection in the lens. But it, it's really not disconcerting. In my practice, I've had no problems with patients rejecting it because it looked funny, and that's something that we've all had experiences with with other coatings in, uh, previously. So here we have the no-glare lens, lens treatment. We have this light scan technology that has the three components that I've already talked about. The blue-violet light is reduced uh, by 20%. Now, some people would ask, well, is 20% enough? Well, I don't know what enough is. I know that our retinal cell death is reduced by 25%, uh, and that to me is pretty significant. Do I wish it were 100%? Yes, but I can't attain that by allowing all the good light to pass through. So there's got to be uh, some place in there where we draw the line. And right now, at least, there's no other no-glare lens on the market that offers this selective. And to me, that's the key word, selective protection against this one band that we've identified, that they've identified, uh, as most harmful. So... This is probably a good time to talk to you about who do I use this lens for in my practice. And really, there's a few groups of patients. Any patient who starts showing the earliest signs of macular degeneration, there's no question, they get this lens. And why wouldn't they want it? I mean, I, I would never have a patient say, no, I'd rather not do that. Doesn't matter what plan they have. Uh, Macular degeneration is scary business, and patients who uh, are in their 60s and 70s have friends that have gone blind from it, and it's, it's just something that we really need to focus in on. Um, and so that's the first group of patients. I mentioned earlier that first-generation patients of macular degeneration people uh, are another category. If, you, if your parents have macular degeneration, you have a four times more likely a statistical chance of getting macular degeneration than someone else in the general population. So that's another group that absolutely, positively ought to have this protection. And again, 
I, I can tell you that in my practice, um, they're so close to this whole disease process that there's no reason why they wouldn't opt in for it. A third group is children. Uh, children are using these devices, these smartphones, these games. Their faces are buried in it. Uh, my five-year-old granddaughter, I mean, she, she, it's, it's just amazing how technology has changed, and that's what these kids do. I sure want to protect them from it because I know that, though, that uh, probably 25% of the light coming out of there is this damaging blue light. So I think young children probably are the third category of patients that in my practice I prescribe this for. And then finally, there's a fourth group, and that is people who are very health conscious. You know, if you look at the dollars people spend at GNC and Costco on all of this uh, just healthy vitamins and, and wellness, it's a huge part of our economy and our civilization, at least in the United States now. When patients come in and say, Dr. Smick, I've been coming to you for years. You know I want whatever is best for my eyes. Is there anything new out there? That's another category, a fourth category of patients that I think uh, I mentioned this to, and many of them are interested in it. It's one of those deals where it sure as heck isn't going to hurt you, and it may just help you, so why wouldn't you do it? And that's kind of my attitude, too. Backside UV reflection protection, we talked about that a little bit, and, uh, and the discovery that 20 to 25% of, um, of the UV light that enters the eye is reflected off the back surface, not passing through the front. And so that is another uh, part of the Crizal Provencia formula, and it does just a great job of that. So I, I like that part of it. And then, uh, again, we talked about this a little bit, but the ESPF factor, which is something that is just starting to become part of our vocabulary. Um, there's not a mother out there that doesn't totally get the whole SPF concept, and they don't load their kids up with SPF 25 and 50 and whatever when they go out in the sun. Well, it's, now it's becoming the same thing with your eyes. Um, we, we use the EISPF formula of 25 for eye sun protection, and that means it gives you 25 times more protection than a clear lens. So that's something that uh, is, is really important, and my parents love for me to talk about that when, when their kids are in the exam chair because... Uh, uh, we all know how much we care for our children. We'll do anything for them. Um, so when we go back then and kind of review this, we talked about light scan, and, and this is in the form of a review, and that deflects 20% of the harmful blue-violet light and reduces cellular death, apoptosis, by 25%, uh, which is significant statistically to make a difference. It allows the good blue turquoise uh, light to pass through. And remember, that's the light just a little bit to the right of, uh, of the spectrum. We get an ESPF of 25, which uh, really is 25 times more protection from UV than no lens at all. And we get all the Crizal protection that we've had all along in terms of glare, scratch-resistant, smudge-resistant, dust, and water. So when you look at the origin of the Crizal coatings and you follow it, a timeline historically, and we keep adding all these other protections against the smudge, dust, water, uh, this is just the next level. So you get, you get this lens, you get all of that other protection plus the blue light protection. And uh, certainly, more and more patients are more and more savvy about protecting their eyes. And they're willing to pay out of pocket, regardless of what vision plan they have, uh, for these added protections. 
and it just makes for a fantastic lens. And there's still a lot of population out there, a big percent of people who want the best. And uh, we're happy to be able to, um, uh, you know, offer that to them and have it available. And uh, my congratulations go to all lens manufacturers for uh, everything from digital surfacing to all the new particular formulas for progressive lenses. I mean, we as eye care providers are able to offer our patients so much more than we ever were that uh, it really makes being an optometrist for me uh, all the better because um, we have so much more now to offer patients that I'm actually taking time in the examination room as a doctor to explain why I am uh, actually prescribing a particular lens for a particular patient. And then when I hand the patient off to the optician and the optician sees what I'm recommending, they can just go ahead and uh, really reinforce that. And it makes it, uh, the patients appreciate that. They, they don't know. They come in. They want to know. They want us. That's why they come to us, uh, and they want an explanation, and they want to know what what they ought to have. And as an optometrist who started uh, 40 years ago, and the optical dispensary was the main part of my practice, and then I've gone through this whole medical model shift, and now we're doing photos and visual fields and OCTs all day long on all of these patients. Now I'm actually finding myself back in the optical dispensary because lens manufacturers are making lenses that actually offer particular benefits for different patients of mine that have particular conditions. And so I find myself actually prescribing certain kinds of lenses and certain lens designs based on the needs of the patient. And that, that's just, I've kind of come full circle, if you will. And that's, uh, that's really fun. So who needs the most protection? Well, I've gone through the four groups of patients that I feel are most appropriate for this particular lenses. Others of you may find other groups of patients that you present it to. It's not a lens I think that everybody needs. It is to some degree a niche lens, but that niche is growing so much that uh, it's, it's really important that I have this in my armamentarium. So in conclusion, and I know we've got about 10 or 12 minutes left here, uh, and we're going to ask, I see there's quite a few questions. So those patients that are at risk for AMD, and that, that really means the patients that I start seeing the earliest signs of drusen in the central macular area, those are patients that, it's not much of a discussion. They're going to get this lens because I don't want 20 years from now or 10 years from now, I don't want their macular degeneration to progress, and it's going to in many of them, and them to come back and say, maybe their lawyer to come back and say, why didn't you tell me about this? Much in the same way that I talked about earlier, that the whole conversation from AREDS2 and nutraceuticals now is becoming a factor. Macular degeneration that flag is going up the flagpole. More and more people are becoming aware of it. More and more people are living longer. And they're going to be afflicted by this. And their friends and family members are going to know about it. I have to be able to have uh, an educated discussion with my patients who uh, fall into this category. So I recommend uh, this particular lens, the Crisol Provencia, to uh, any of my patients who are at risk, we've talked about those patients, and we need to protect the eyes from the newer blue-violet lights emitted from the modern digital devices. You know, it, it's like anything else, times are changing. Well, even something as basic as our light source is changing, and uh, that brings new risks. Yeah. They're much more efficient, and that's why the government is actually mandating that we change. But uh, because of this change, I, I think not everyone is aware of the fact that there are also some risks along with this 
and we as uh, primary eye care providers have to be aware of that, and we need to do that. So here are some discussions that uh, you should have with your patients, that I have with my patients. How do you protect your eyes on a daily basis? And a lot of people take that for granted, but when you start to engage them in a conversation about it, uh, you know, vision is way high on the list of what patients are most concerned about losing. So it really makes it easy to get into a logical discussion. Do you have a family history of macular? Well, of course, we all ask that uh, on our patient information sheets. How much time do you spend in front of digital devices? And then make sure they know that there is UV and now blue light potential damage from light, and uh, we can help them protect that. So I hope then that this has given you a couple things. Number one, it's a product that science really does, and this is new science. It's emerging. There's going to be a lot more to come by a lot of different sources, but I have a stack of articles on my desk written by PhDs in math and physics, physics, not the eye care people that you normally think of. Um, and this stack is probably eight inches thick of articles that have to do with blue light damage to the retina. This is a real phenomenon, and uh, it's something that as eye care providers, optometrists, ophthalmologists, opticians, we all need to become aware of. And I can tell you that uh, our industry, industry is going to become bombarded with new products to help prevent damage to our vision. So Adam, uh, do we have some questions from our uh, audience out there? Absolutely, and thanks so much. For, that was actually really, really informative, and we got a bunch of questions. But before we get into the questions, I, I almost forgot. If you look at the bottom part of your screen, um, you'll see a white paper that's down there. It's a PDF file, and you can feel free to download that uh, and, and read it after the show is done. All It was a roundtable of experts uh, done in 2013 talking all about blue light and the damage it can do. So feel free to, to read along with that. But um, getting on to the questions. So we do have a whole bunch of them. And uh, I guess why don't we take them chronologically from the top? Uh, so uh, first question, um, how come the preventia can't deflect more than 20% of the blue-violet light? And, and, and that's a good question. And I've been asked that question often. I've given this lecture uh, half a dozen times around the country. And it's not so much a question of why can't it, because it could. Uh, but the problem is you've got to be able to moderate how much of the good light gets through and maintain a, a perfectly clear lens so that uh, uh, visual acuity is not uh, interfered with and color. So you, you could get a yellower lens and block even more of the blue light but I can tell you that my patients would reject it immediately. So it's a delicate uh, walking on wire situation here where you've got to keep the balance between block enough to be statistically significant, but allow enough of the good light to come through, maintain the clarity of the lens. That's really important for lens companies and for us as doctors and opticians. And finally, um, be able to have a cosmetically attractive lens because we got in so much trouble with our yellow lenses in uh, 10 years ago that they died. So good question, and it's not how come they can't, it's how come they don't, and it's a balancing act. And we'll see what happens five years from now. Right. Um, we have a bunch of questions here that are really more practice management related. I'll lump them all into one. Can you speak at all to uh, the vision care plans and, and sort of uh, is this being covered at all by any of the companies yet or are they a little bit behind the curve? I think they're behind the curve. Uh, I have looked into that. And, um, you know, to some degree, I, I, I have two different feelings about this whole subject. Certainly when, when different features of lenses are covered, more people take advantage of it, but the reimbursement is less. So to be able to have some products that are add-ons, 
uh, enough patients, if you present it right, and this is a medical thing here, uh, if you present it right, then the cost is not going to be as significant a barrier as it was, and it, it's really nice to be able to get paid for the product. So I hope I answered sure. that. Sure. Um, question here that is probably a little bit out of, out of your, uh, your comfort zone, but a, a question about uh, laws. Um, are you aware of any laws um, that regulate the amount of UV and, and blue violet light that, say, an LED bulb or screen can give off? Are there any regulations yet? There are not. I, I am aware of that, and it is in my comfort zone, because uh, uh, I was part of a panel. Uh, we had like three optometrists, but there were eight other people who were PhDs in math and physics around the country and from Europe, too, that talked about all this. And in Europe and in the United States, there are no regulations yet. And we think what's happened, the efficiency of these lights are incredible. I mean, it really is going to save gajillions of dollars. I have no idea what the real number is. But I know that it's the right thing to do from an economic point of view. And I applaud that. But I think the government and the people that uh, mandate all this never even gave it a thought as to the harmful side effects of it. So, no, we're way behind in that aspect of it. Right. Um, another question that this sort of crossed my mind, too. Have you heard of any company working to actually put this coating on the screens themselves or on the bulbs themselves or anything that might emit this harmful light? I have not. That's a great question. I just came back last week from the Consumer Electronics Show, which uh, for those listeners of yours who know, that's 150,000 people. It's the largest uh, show or uh, exhibit hall, if you will, in the United States each year. And I go with a group of optometrists every year, uh, unofficially, just, just looking at what's out there. We've talked to several different companies about this, and it's something that they really don't even give a second thought to. So, uh, yeah, great question, whoever thought of that. Uh, and wouldn't it be wonderful? But uh, no, there's nothing going on right now. And, and I mean, we met with um, half a dozen companies that are really big into uh, emission control of new TV screens. We, there, are, there are two or three companies that we met with that have new television technology. Uh, as, as most of you know right now, the 1020i or 1020p, uh, the HD TV was a huge step. Well, now we're getting 4K and 8K. Now, whether there'll be programming in that, I'm not sure. But the clarity of these new screens is so phenomenal. Uh, and many of them aren't even available in the U.S. yet. They're Chinese manufacturers. <laughs> and it's overwhelming. And I figure I'm going to have to buy a new TV every year for the rest of my life to keep up with all this. <laughs> I'm laughing, actually, because I have a Chinese 4K monitor on my desk right now. <laughs> That's amazing. But there's no programming so, yet. But I learned. Right. So it's, it's great for computers, not so good for TV. <laughs> but, yeah. But I also learned that the Koreans who who are re rapidly becoming one of the biggest TV manufacturers, and the Japanese have both passed a law that all programming within by the year 2020 is going to have to be in 4K at least. Well, they're the ones who hmm. sell the TVs, so guess what? That's pretty, pretty cool, and, and I, I, I really wish I were a little younger because I love television, I love the new clarity of screens, and some of the things I've been seeing really blow your mind. Sure. And you know, what's interesting about the 4K screens, too, is that they are much brighter as well. To be able to push through all those pixels, the LED lamps that they're using are actually quite bright. So I'm yes, almost wondering right. if we actually looked at, if we look at the spectrum of these things, I sort of wonder what, you know, what is this doing to people? Yeah. Great. So let's see if we have any more, any more questions here. Uh, Many, many, but let's see. Oh, here's a great question. So how do you actually prescribe this? What, what labs uh, work with this new product? Well, you know, um, and, and I'm not really, 
uh, we use different labs and different companies' lenses, so um, I, I don't think it matters what lab you use. Right now, the Crizal product is the one that's by far the most advanced for this selective absorption. So it doesn't matter whether you're using an Essilor lab or an Essilor partner lab or just any lab. Almost all labs carry Essilor products. And so if you really need this lens, I think you, I, I feel fairly safe in saying that it's available from whatever lab you're currently using. And I know there are a couple exceptions to that. But um, basically speaking, it's widely available. And I know other companies will be, you know, this, it, it's incredible how much money, uh, it, and this is sponsored by Essilor, I don't mind saying that, it's incredible how much money they spend on this research. I mean, it's overwhelming to me that to see the, the R&D facility that they've contracted with not even their facility. They're paying an outside company to do all this research. And these PhDs uh, are, it, it's, it's truly exciting as an optometrist, as an eye care provider, to see the research that's going on in this area and in other areas. It's, it's, it's really exciting what's coming down the line. Right. And, uh, Here's a practical question for you, and actually I'm really curious about the answer to this too since I have a four-year-old whose face is constantly buried in an iPad. Um, what if you have a child who actually doesn't need any vision correction, but their parents you know, would be interested in getting a product like this? What do you tell them? Yeah, so I tell them to, for a few hours a day, and I, I truly believe this, by the way, Adam, for a few hours a day, I think there's no reason why you shouldn't get them some plain old lenses that have this application. Uh, it's, again, it's one of those things, I don't know, it's too early to know how much good you're doing, but you sure as heck aren't doing any bad, and why wouldn't you do that? Um, my five-year-old granddaughter does not wear glasses, my 10 and 8-year-old grandsons do, uh, all three of them have this protection now. Because I'm, I'm truly overwhelmed, and I'm a 69-year-old, so this is, this is all new to me. Um, I'm overwhelmed to go to their house, and they are glued six, six inches away for hours at a time. And we try to be good grandparents when we keep the kids and say, all right, for the next hour you can't use your devices, and it's like the world is coming to an end. I mean, that's just where they are today. So, uh, yeah, good question, and I think uh, do no harm rule applies. Uh, you can't hurt anything. Why wouldn't you do that if you really sure. care about them? Good question. Sure. So we're just about running out of time. I want to remind everyone that if you have more questions, take them over to ODWire, and we'll keep talking about this topic over there uh, since it has you know, provoked a lot of interest over the past year since we've been running this series. So I guess with only a couple minutes left, do you have any sort of final parting thoughts for us? Well, I just think that um, as an eye care provider, I love the fact that I've transitioned strongly through the concept of the medical model and uh, tomorrow's clinical optometrist is going to be armed with um, not only all the basic optics that they've learned in optometry school and, uh, and that, and now we've gone through the medical model and, and with, with uh, glaucoma and diabetes and macular degeneration, just growing so quickly, that's going to become a very important part of the primary care, uh, private practice optometrists, uh, not only livelihood, but responsibility. And so now that we're getting lenses that uh, have a medical application, and I have glaucoma patients with restricted visual fields, and so what progressive lens design they get is even important to me. I'm now starting to become more and more interested back in my optical dispensary. 
And in the exam room, I am prescribing different lens applications based on my patient's needs. And that's pretty exciting because I did get away from that for a while. But these all companies are providing us with so many um, phenomenal lens designs that it really becomes important for me as an optometrist uh, and my staff to really become more knowledge about, knowledgeable about all these products. And so I, I truly hope that all of the lens manufacturers will be more forthcoming with continuing education uh, because optometry needs to get back in this game. Absolutely. Well, that's a great note to end on. So, Kurt, thanks so much for being here. This is a great presentation, and thanks, everyone, for showing up tonight. And our door prize tonight, as you know, was one of those iPad Airs, one of those devices that gives out a huge amount of blue light. <laughs> the software is about to kick us off, but what I'm going to do is do the drawing, and then I'll email uh, the lucky winner of the device, and you know, you'll hear all about it on OD Wire. So thanks again, everyone, for coming, and I guess I'll see you online. Thanks, Adam. Good night, everybody.